Title, Temporary Construct. Principle, man's spirit is given only for the span of his life. Turn Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter, <coughs> verse 6 and 7. Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. The spirit is one is the one temporary part of man's triune makeup. Everybody, saved or unsaved, in eternity will have a soul and a body. The unsaved will not have a spirit, and the saved will have the Holy Spirit. So the spirit is only given for a temporary period of time. Principle. Scripture teaches that death, the unsaved are forever cut off from contact with God because they have lost their spiritual connection. Turn to Psalms 115, verse 17. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. What he's saying here is those that are dead don't praise the Lord. They don't have the ability. And those that are recently <coughs> been uh, killed or murdered or whatever that are on their way down don't praise the Lord. They lose their ability because the spirit is no longer there. 88 verse 4 to 5 I am counted with them that go down into the pit I am as a man that hath no strength <clears throat> free among the dead like the slain that lie in the grave whom thou rememberest no more and they are cut off from thy hand. <clears throat> so when the severance is made, when the spirit departs, all the connections <clears throat> with God are severed. Remembrance, capability of enjoying things in the spiritual, in other words, life. Life in its essence is lost forever. Existence continues, but life ceases. Scripture teaches, before the fall, man's spirit was in contact with man's consciousness and allowed him to be in harmony with the consciousness of YHVH. It was the spirit that was the center of man's life that didn't dwell within him. It was the connection between him, himself, his consciousness, his higher consciousness, <coughs> and the consciousness of God and the consciousness of the environment. It connected the physical, kind, what our minds, what we would consider the present day mind, it connected that with the mind of God, the spiritual consciousness of God man was in communion with. Turn to Genesis, the second chapter. 
verse 19. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now the word call there, it's interesting. It means to summon. It means to summon with the assertion of sovereignty over. So what Adam called, he also in the name, he named it, it was an identity, but in the identity, at the same time, he's exerting sovereignty over the creature, which pleased YHVH, because the call, the word call, is the same word when it's used for Elohim's calling light, light, calling darkness, darkness. It was an identification with the real realization, the uh, a reality of sovereignty over the thing that is being called. So man, because of his communion with the mind of Elohim, could think like Elohim because Elohim, in this particular place, capacity in the spiritual, gave man a sovereignty because the scripture says he's made in the image of Elohim. Only <clears throat> it's limited to the earth, never to the heavens. But in the earth realm, man was to be a duplicate of Elohim, a custodian, a sovereign custodian over what Elohim had put him in charge of. The same thing was true with YHVH. Man was in communion with the mind of YHVH and who understood how to remain in harmony with the, the flow of the direction of what he was given to do. That's why he could be put over a vast region, one man, and uh, would be able to take total control over this vast region. Eden, Eden was a region which had four rivers flowing through it. I mean, it had to be vast because only something the size of a state or a national park can support a river flowing through it. This thing had four rivers. <clears throat> so Adam was created to be a sovereign over the physical. His problem, of course, was that he wanted to go beyond that. He wanted to be like the gods who are sovereigns over the spiritual. Let's see the next principle. Scripture teaches the fall, man lost contact with the spirit, which was still in contact with God. In other words, it was severed. <clears throat> Turn to Genesis, the third chapter, verse 7. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Now the word eyes there uh, connotes the meaning of sight. Is a sight where was open. In other words, they became aware of something they were not aware of before. What it is stating is that when man's connection with his spirit was broken, his connection with a higher God consciousness was severed. He could no longer relate from that perspective. All his abilities were severed. He could no longer command his spirit to access the abilities that were put within his soul. His consciousness devolved onto the secondary, which was the physical consciousness, the senses. And in the sensory sector, emotions began to come to four based on what he received from his senses. And the first emotion that he experiences was shame. 
and then fear, negative emotions. Why? Because this is what the senses, the information they gain from the sensory perception, which before would be never be ascended into because man's function was on a higher plateau. He, he was on a level in which these emotions would never come into play. The spirit consciousness sight overawed the physical. The consciousness of the physical was totally dependent upon the spiritual consciousness. And when the spiritual consciousness was severed because of the spiritual connection with man being severed, then it evolved on to <clears throat> the secondary consciousness, and that's how he's been operating ever since. Principle. Buddha teaches in life, God moves through man's spirit to do supernatural or natural things. In other words, God does not operate through man's mind, his consciousness, his lower consciousness. He doesn't operate through the soul. He operates the same way he operated in Adam's time, through the spirit. Only man is not aware of God operating in the spirit, whether saved or unsaved. Uh, in the saved perspective, yes, he does become aware. But in the unsaved perspective, he isn't aware. Turn to Judges, the 13th chapter, verse 24 to 25. Women bear a son, called his name Samson. The child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. So Samson's strength came when the Spirit would come upon his spirit and enable him to do supernatural feats of strength, but it was all through the spirit. It didn't move on his mind, it didn't move in his soul, it moved in his spirit. Turn to Romans, the eighth chapter, verse sixteen. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's one aspect. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit of all things. Again, God operates through the Spirit. Not the mind, not the soul, but the Spirit. It moves upon the Spirit. And the Spirit sets the mind, sets the man in motion. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20. We are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. <clears throat> so it's telling us here, that we glorify God <clears throat> in the outward and in the inward by enabling our life to reflect the life of God. And God gives us instruction <clears throat> from the Holy Spirit to our spirit and that instruction enables us to perceive, to mature, to grow, and to put ourselves in motion in the direction that God has ordained for us to go. It is a question of becoming familiar with the desires, 
motivations of the spirit. The spirit has desires. The spirit will quicken. The spirit will allow us to receive the things that the body and the soul actually need. <clears throat> First Corinthians 14, verse 15. I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding. <clears throat> it's talking about our spirit and our mind. It's talking about the ability of the Spirit to manifest in us the things of God. And when it manifests those things in us, we enable it to manifest it on the outside. <clears throat> Praying with the Spirit is talking about the prayer language. The prayer language is a language in which we can operate at will. It's not referring to the prayer language that the Holy Spirit gives us to interpret tongues or to speak in tongues it's talking about the language of the spirit communing with God in 1 Corinthians about <clears throat> the 13th chapter or the 14th chapter it says <clears throat> he who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men but he speaks unto God that's the language of the spirit so we pray in the Spirit, we can sing in the Spirit. <clears throat> Praying in the Spirit, singing in the Spirit basically deals with the unity of the Holy Spirit incorporating into worship. Praying with the Spirit means that we pray with our own spiritual ability. <clears throat> Praying with the understanding. When the understanding is open to the Spirit, then we can connect and vocalize because we understand what the will of God is and we can pray in the will of God. Revelation, the sixth chapter, verse 18. <clears throat> Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Grace is unmerited favor. God gives us grace through the spirit. That's where his grace, his unmerited favor lodges. That's where his presence is in the spirit. The Holy Spirit collaborates with our spirit. The Holy Spirit transfers grace, a merited favor, to our spirit. And when we allow our spirit to manifest it in the outer life, it comes forth in <clears throat> reality and it affects the things of our life if we allow it to. 1 Thessalonians, 5th chapter, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved. Notice the, the order in which he speaks. Spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what's being said here? <coughs> Scripture says, The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. This means that the outer and the mind 
have control to a certain degree over the spirit. In the outer life, where you go, you take your spirit. The things that you surround yourself with influence your spirit. <clears throat> what you do in your life, your conversation, what you see, feel, hear with the senses, all affect the spirit. When the outer is so concerned with the affairs of the outer, <clears throat> it overrides the desires of the inner. If we understand the desires of our spirit and we choose to accede to the desires of the spirit, you will find yourself always walking in light. You will find yourself wanting to be in light because that's the desire of the spirit, not of the mind or the body or the soul. So that means when we go to a place or do a thing that's contrary to the will of the spirit, we're denying our spirit growth, we're denying our spirit freedom, we're denying our spirit the ability to move in the direction in which God would have us to move because the life is dominated by the senses, not by the spirit. When we reach that point, where we tap into the desires of the spirit and it reaches a stage of <coughs> knowledge. In other words, the spirit conveys its desire, which becomes, if we allow it to become so strong, that we are impelled to seek out satisfying the spirit rather than the outer that will take us into places in which the spirit will feel comfortable. Now we read when we read for Second Corinthians the fifth chapter, what we read is that the spirit itself it, for the most part is miserable because it's in housed in a, an alien environment for which it was not created. <clears throat> our job is to make our spirit as comfortable as possible because it is our spirit that's going to take us to the throne of God. Not our body, not our mind, not our soul, but our spirit. The spirit, we said, was a temporary loan to us. When we allow ourselves to be led by the Holy Spirit in our spirit, <clears throat> ultimately it's a time of transition. When the spirit departs, the Holy Spirit takes over fully. And we enter into <clears throat> the fullness of the spiritual capacity having lived a life in which we have yielded to the desires of the Spirit. Those Christians <coughs> who live apart from satisfying, gratifying the desires of the Spirit will never reach full maturity. And when they pass this life, their Spirit departs, the Holy Spirit takes over at the juncture of whatever state of maturity the person is in. They still have their carnal desires which mitigate against the spirit. Therefore, they limit the ability to function in the spiritual realm and they'll be on a lower scale. <clears throat> Saying this, to say this. Sacrifice to take your spirit where it will go. When you do, you're investing in your own eternity. The stuff of this world, all of it is going to pass away. It's there to distract. It's there to hinder. It's there to do whatever it can do to stand in opposition to our progress. Open yourself up to the desires of your own spirits. And when you do, your circumstances will begin to change. If the mind is dominant, emotions are dominant, the circumstances aren't going to change when they remain the same. Because the life is not being given over to the spirit to grow, to affect the change. Change can come into being because we are not allowing it. It's only in the spirit. The scripture says, where the spirit is, there is liberty, freedom. Now the spirit desires to come forth 
and to ultimately dominate and watch circumstances alter.